Steve opened, Steve opened his eyes. He was laying on the couch, but where? The layout of the small room was familiar, but when he had seen it before, it had been empty. Now there has been a chocolate brown couch he was laying on in a matching arm chair. There was a coffee table stacked with both fashion magazines and tech theme magazines and a large cabinet with flat screen TV and a few different kind of video game consoles. The walls that had been blank before were now hung with photos of Victoria. Victoria hugging, hiking on the mountains, her luxurious hair wind-blowing beautiful, Victoria tan and t toned and gorgeous in the emerald green two-piece swimsuit, lounging on the beach, Victoria eating an ice cream, cone in the park, bench looking adorable with a dab of ice cream on her perfect nose, Victoria herself came paddling barefoot in the room, wearing a jeans and black fit t-shirt. Haven't she been wearing a dress earlier? Then again, the room was been empty earlier too. Steve was hopelessly confused and disoriented. Hey babe, Victoria said, you've been bad dizzy spell and kind of passed out on the couch. I brought you a glass of water, why don't you try and sit up and drink a little? Steve had never had a dizzy spell before. But now that he thought about it, he had been too nervous on the day to eat breakfast this morning. He sat up slowly. You know, I think maybe I need to eat something. He accepted the water glass. And was surprised to find himself drinking it down a few gulps. Weren't it we were going to have a painting on the floor? Now Victoria looked confused. A painting on the floor? You mean like on our first date? Our first date? But isn't this... Steen looked around the furniture the room. I'm sorry, I'm really confused. Victoria sat down next to him and took his hand, confused or not. Steve ha loved having her close to him, touching him. It happens, honey, it happens, he said, squeezing his hand. Sometimes you forget things. You have memory loss as a result of that car accident you had a few years ago. I don't remember a car accident, Steve said. He was a very careful driver. Exactly, Victoria squeezed his knee. You took a bad hit on the head, brain damp injury. Most of the time you're fine, but sometimes your memory just white temporarily. And then it's like you reset and you're all good again. This was upsetting news. He wondered how many times Victoria had told him to do. But I always reset, so I remember things again. Victoria smiled. Oh, always. Steam nodded. The explanation was weird, but it also made sense. Since time was off, then explained everything. So you and I were... Together? Victoria laughed. We are very, very together. We. She got up and ran the couch and grabbed one of the frame pictures on the wall and handed it to him. The phone was taken outdoors. Under the arch flowers, Victoria sat smiling and lacing white gown and veil, holding a bouquet of flowers that matched the ones decorated in the arch. Steve was standing beside her with a tux, and then the main thing he was wearing was an impossible big smile. No wonder, Steve thought. His wedding day had been the happiest day in his life. Too bad he had no memory of it whatsoever. You're so beautiful, he said. It was a beautiful dress, Victoria said. Not just in the picture, Steve said. Always. You're always so beautiful. Oh, you're too sweet for me, Victoria said. She leaned forward and pressed his lips on his. It was wonderful. It felt like their first kiss. Dada, wake up. It's time for pancakes. Steve opened his eyes. Two children were standing beside the bed. They were wearing pajamas with some kind of cartoon characters on them and jumping up and down yelling, Pancakes, pancakes. The girl looked to be around four and a boy around two. Both of them had thick black hair and big brown green freckles. They were beautiful kids. A girl and a boy had always wanted. But he had no memory. A pregnancy or births or infancy or childhoods before this happened. He didn't even know the kid's name. Were they his? Pancakes? Huh? He said, sitting up in the bed and trying to very ignore himself. The walls, he noticed, were covered with photos of children from babyhood until now. Steve was even in some of the pictures with them. Today is Saturday and Saturday mom Mama always makes pancakes, the little girl said as she lectured him. Okay, sounds good. Steve said, standing up, lead the way. The girl took one of his hands, and the boy took the other. It was a sweet and familiar feeling, these tiny hands gripping his. Victoria was in the kitchen, looking beautiful even in her pink bathrobe with no makeup and 
hair on style. She was standing over a skinning, expertly flipping pancakes. All hail the pancake queen, Steve said, kissing her cheek. Pancake wench is more like it, she said, laughing. I always forget what the long process this is until I'm actually doing it. How we appreciate it, don't we, kids? He said. He guessed he'll just call them kids until he got a clue about their names were. Thank you, Mama, the kid said, hugging her. You're very welcome, she said. Now, Abigail and Avery, if you take your seat on the table, I have your pancakes ringing in a minute. She turned to Steve and hummed me. The coffee's ready if you'd like to get some. Sure, he said. Though in his head, he was repeating, Abigail and Avery, Abigail and Avery. He didn't know where the co coffee cups were, and he opened the wrong cabinet at the first and got it right the second try. He poured them in each cup. The tourist said, just a splash of milk in mine, remember? He didn't remember, but he said, of course, and got the milk out of the fridge. It was a happy breakfast. The pancakes themselves were terrific, and the bacon was crispy the way he liked it. But the best part was sitting around the table as a family, the kids talking and laughing. He smiled, and Victoria shared private smiles. This is what he always wanted. Did it matter that he didn't remember how he got it? Maybe it didn't. People were always saying to live in the moment, and that's what Steve was doing. You couldn't, hang, you couldn't get hang up on your past if you couldn't remember it. So are you still planning on fixing the leaky faucet in the bathroom today? Victoria said. Steve didn't remember that this was the plan. He had learned about plumbing from his dad, so he was happy to comply. I'll certainly give it a, a shot, he said. A few minutes later, when Steve came back in the living room after fixing the faucet, Victoria was sitting in the couch in the living room looking distressed. We need to talk, he said. Memory problems aside, Steve will knew that particular sentence never meant good news. Okay, he said, sitting down beside her. She picked up an envelope on the coffee table. This is from the mail today. He, she handed it to him. He took out the letter and read the notice, where it's notice of foreclosure. Wait, what? Is our house being foreclosed on? Apparently so, Victoria said. We've been underwater financially for a while. I really want to stay at home with the kids until they start kindergarten. But if I have to, I guess I have to go back to work. Let's not be hasty, he said. He knew he was going to feel like an idiot saying, but what he was going to say next. But I have to ask, he had to ask the question. Do I have a job? Sure, Victoria said. You work at the gas up. Oh, he said. I guess he had from God about not to clean toilets. But even with your working overtime, the pay there doesn't keep up the cost of living. Especially since the kids came along, Victoria said. Well, I'm just going to have to find a better paying job then. Victoria gave him a brave smile. It would be wonderful if you could. Here comes the tickle monster. Steve stretched out his arms and wiggled his finger. Abigail and Avery ran through the living room giggling. Chase me, Papa, chase me. I'm not saying what I actually said. Heck no, I'm not doing it. Avery yelled. He couldn't get over the small burst of happiness he felt every time one of the kids called him Papa. He heard it before he saw it. That was in a very long gravery driveway. If someone was approaching, you always heard the sound of wheels on the gravery road every few seconds before you saw the car. He saw, looking at the window, and in the case, the car was shiny, black, expensive looking. Unless he had forgotten, which was most extremely likely, given his memory problems, they weren't expecting anyone. He wondered if it might be someone who wanted to talk to him about the foreclosure, who might want him to sign some papers making the loss of his family house official. Steve braced himself for the worst. Kids, he said, you should get washed up dinners for soon. Your mom's making spaghetti and meatballs. Spaghetti and meatballs, Abigail sang, taking her brother to the hands. I like meatballs, Avery said. They hurry off to wash their hands, leaving Steve to meet his fate. Steve stepped out the porch. The black car came to a stop. A moment later, a man stepped out of it. It was strange. Steve had forgotten so much, and yet he still remembered this man. The style hailed a perfect suit. Steve didn't remember exactly what it said in his business card. Brock Edwards, talent infusionist, fast bear entertainment. The man smiled as he approached. His teeth were dowling. Mr. Snodworth, he said. We met before. Brock Edwards, fast bear entertainment, he said, holding on his hand to shake. You have a good memory, Mr. Edwards said, taking Steve's offer hand for some things, he said. Would you like to sing on the porch? We can go outside, but I got a four-year-old and two-year-old, so I can't guarantee much quiet. The 
porch is perfect, Mr. Edward said. Once they were sat on the porch of two rocking chairs, Steve asked, Can I get anything to drink? Iced tea? Lemonade? No, thank you, Mr. Edwards. Then, Steve, since your memory's so good, I'm sure you remember the offer I made you last time we met. Strangely, Steve could remember every detail of the horror games based on the myths surrounding Fazbear entertainment. Now facing enclosure, the idea of games didn't seem quite so objectionable. I do, he said. Mr. Edward nodded. Well, we here at Fazbear Entertainment want you to know that the offer still stands. Can I stay here with my family to work on them? He remembered the last time he offered was involved recloding in a disclosed area. Yes, Mr. Edward said. We want you to work whatever and however you are most comfortable. Face, Steve's face broke out in a grin. Their house was safe. He didn't hesitate. I'll take it, he said. The night in Victor that night in bed, Victoria laid her head on the shoulders. I can't believe you saved us, he said. Fazbear Entertainment face saved us, he said. Steve said, he, though he had to admit, her words made him feel good. Well, if you didn't have talent, skills, and fast parent team wanted, then we wouldn't have been saved. Therefore, you saved us. She planted a kiss on his cheek. You're my hero. Ah, uh, shucks, Steve said, but he had to admit, he did feel pleased with himself. They held each other close, and Steve fell in a deep sleep. It was coming from the living room, a stomping, rambling sound, a robber. The house was so far in the country, Steve was shocked that someone could find it to rob. He got out of it and put his phone in the pocket in his robe, prepared to call the police, but wait. When would he last use his phone? All he could remember is the last time he tried, he hadn't worked at all. He was going to take matters in his own hand. He was scared, but he had to protect his family. He grabbed a softball bat that was closet and marched to the living room as far as confident instead of. Terrified, Abigail was standing in front of the coffee table and bumping into repeatedly. Her eyes were blank and strangely seeming like nothing. Sweet, are you okay? Steve asked, trying to not sound panic. He turned to him to face him and smile. Oh, hi, Papa. Sweetheart, it's the middle of the night. You should go back to bed. Okay, Papa. She snuffled down the wall and disappeared into her room. The door to Avery's room was slightly ajar, which was a natural state of all interior doors in the house. For some reason, none of them were fully closed, let alone lock. Just to make sure his son was okay, Steve peeked in his room. Avery was asleep safe and sound, sprawled out with one foot dangling over the side of the bed like always. Steve was relieved there was no intruder, but he was also worried and confused. He propped the softball bat up against the wall and climbed back into bed. What are you doing? In his anxious state, his wife's noise made him nearly jump out of the skin. He took a deep breath, trying to calm down. Didn't you hear the noise in the living room? No, I didn't hear anything, Victoria said. And you know what a light sleeper I am. If there had been the noise, I definitely would have heard it. Maybe you were dreaming. No, it was real. When I went into the living room, Abigail was standing there. She looked blank and weird and was bumping into furniture. Victoria gave him a patient smile. Sweetheart, do you remember the tailor and sleepwalk sometimes? They get it from you. You've been sleeping wild stuff, saying absurd things and wandering all over the house. You know, I even caught you wandering around the yard one night. With you, it's sleepwalking with night terrors. Unfortunately, the kids just seem to have gotten the sleepwalking part. No, he said, I don't remember any of that. It was so upsetting to not even be able to piece his recent past together, to even remember basic facts about him and his kids. Well, now you know that there's no need to worry, Victoria smiled and painted her empty spot beside him. Come back to bed. Steve couldn't sleep. He had always had the same sensation of someone or something inside a house wishing to be, wishing to do him and his family harm. And always Victoria comfort him, reminding him about his history of sleepwalking and night terrors. Often Steve marveled at what an amazing wife she was, always so kind and patient and caring. He figured it couldn't be easy to be married with someone like him who had such a mess at times. It was such a mess all the time. Mess or not, he was really pouring himself into making the first Fazbear Entertainment game. Since the company agreed to let him work at home, he had turned the house tiny adding into his office. He called his daily climbing off on the ladder his commute to work. It was nice to hear Victoria and the children talking and playing beneath him when he was working. And to know that lunchtime, all he had to do was climb down the ladder to join them. 
He was still haunted by the nighttime visions and fears, and during the day he channeled all those feelings in the game he was creating. Those feelings of being unsafe all ended up in the screen in front of him. If Fazbear Entertainment wanted a scary game, then a scary game is what they're going to have. When Steve climbed down the ladder for lunch, Abigail said, Surprise, Papa, we're having a picnic. A voice on the radio that Victoria kept on during the day said, Heavy thunderstorms expected over the next 24 hours. Take shelter if possible, folks. Lightning is dangerous. Doesn't sound like picnic weather, Steve said. Victoria, who was carrying a pit, Picture of lemonade laugh. I thought we had a picnic indoors, like our first date. The picnic was nice. Victoria held the blanket on the floor and they ate chicken salad sandwiches and grass and drank lemonade. After they ate, Abigail say, Papa, let's play hide and seek. Hide and seek, Avery, Avery yelled. Steve knew if he wanted to play with them a while, he might try them out and so they would take a nap and gave their mom a break. Sure, he said. I can play a few rounds before I have to go back to work. The kids jumped up and down in a frenzy of delight. Steve felt his heart filled with love. They were such adorable, amazing kids. He wished he could remember every minute he had spent with them. Steve covered his eyes and started counting out loud very slowly. One, two, three. When he reached twenty, he opened his eyes and began to search. Abigail was old enough to be a pretty good hider, but Avery could always be found in plain sight. Right now, he was standing behind a floor lamp. Steve, like always, looked around as far as he couldn't see his son, then finally moved close to the lamp. Where's Avery? Where's Avery? Steve asked loudly and theoretically. He called to Victoria. We heard, have you seen Avery? No, honey, I have no idea where he could be. She called back. Victoria knew her part of the game well. I sure do wish I could find him, Steve said. Behind the floor lamp, Avery giggled. Steve kept up the rush and not being able to find Avery until Avery's giggling grew more and more out of control. He finally jumped up and said, Papa, I'm here. Steve put his hand on his chest and jumped backwards with startled. There you are. You got me. You're such a good hider. I got you, Avery said, still overcome with hurriedly. Now I just need to find your sister, Steve said. He wandered around the house and didn't see her anywhere. He felt prickly of anxiety. He knew she was nearby and safe and just playing, but somehow, something about her invisibility triggered a primal parenting fear. He thought of the parents whose children go missing for real, who spend months or years trying to find them. He thought of the missing persons reports and kids' faces in milk cartons. He suddenly wanted to find Amber go very badly to see her beautiful little face. The bedroom closet he had hidden there before went into the bedroom but hesitated before opening the closet door. Something inside him didn't want to open it. Maybe because it made him think of night terrors, of the sounds in the house that he investigated with a feeling of dread, not wanting to know what was causing them, but needing to know. Boo! The closet door swung open and Abigail jumped out. Steve cried out for real and jumped backwards, his heart pounding in his chest. Wow, you really got me, he said once he recovered enough to talk. Silly, Papa, it's just me. Abigail said, did you think it was a ghost? Yeah, I kind of did, Steve said. You're right. That, that is very, very silly. Even in the daylight, even when playing with the kids, the fear was creeping in. He was afraid of noises, sudden movements, even his own little girl jumping out of him. He went inside, climbed the ladder, and started back in the, in the game. It was easy for Steve to create jump scares because he had been receiving he was on the receiving end of one himself. He knew the startled feeling, the cry of shock, the accelerated heat, and then the wash of relief when you realize it was just a game and you're really safe. Well, he knew all those things except for the relief. Lately, he never felt like he was safe. Steve sat in front of the TV, staring at the night, late night talk show without really watching it. Victoria stood in the doorway in her bathroom pajamas. Honey, are you coming for the bed? Sure. Steve said, raising the remote to click the TV, to click off the TV. I thought I might make myself some warm milk first, though. You know, try to relax. You definitely need to relax, Victoria said. Have some milk, and then maybe I'll give you a shoulder massage. That would be nice, Steve said absently. Progression going to bed had become a habit of him. It made him sense. Really, the last time he spent sleeping, the fewer nightmares he'll have. He drank his warm milk and let Victoria nail his shoulders. Both of these things seemed relaxing at the time he was doing them. 
but as soon as his head hit the pillow, his body felt like one big ball of tension. It was worse than that. It was terror. He lay there, his eyes wide and open, fighting sleep. Then he heard it, the wearily, the rumbling. They were inside the walls, and if it wasn't a nightmare because he knew he had never fallen asleep. Whatever it was that was after him was inside the walls, scurrying, scratching, and looking for a way out. He felt a sudden need to flee the, bath the bedroom, but when he stood in the doorway, he heard more rustling and rattling coming from the living room. So they, there were two. He backed up and tried to close the bedroom door, but it was useless. There was no way to lock yourself in the cave intruders out. No one was safe. Steve and his family were sitting ducks, all of them. A loud bump come from the bedroom wall at Steve's left. He turned to look at it. The surface of the wall began to pause and throb, forming a large bubble over the surface and that reminded Steve of the way cheese bubbles up the pizza. Then, with a white splat, a bubble popped like a zit, an oily black something scattered across the room. Steve needed to get out of there. He needed Victoria out of there. How could you be sleeping through this? He ran over to her side in the bed and shook her shoulder. Victoria, wake up. What is it? Are the kids okay? Victoria said that, rubbing her eyes. Unable to find words, Steve pointed to the wall, which now has a gaping hole on the black. What? Why do you want me to look at the wall? Don't you see it? The black slime was dripping from the floor. Victoria shook, took his hand. Honey, you're having a nightmare. Lie back down. I'm not having a nightmare because I'm not asleep. Steve yelled. He never raised his voice to his wife or kids, but he was freaking out. I know it feels like it's because you're walking and talking. Victoria said, but if you don't lie down and close your eyes, it will go away. Desperate to escape his terror, Steve let himself be coded into lying back down. He closed his eyes, feeling how tired he was, how much his body longed for rest. But the noise in the walls didn't stop. There was no sleeping for him tonight. This is DJ Ma Dan, the music man. The voice of the vo radio said, we got heavy snow coming on right now. No time to get out and buy milk and bread. Just stay home and stay safe. Abigail looked at the window and snout. He's right, it's snowing. By morning, the yard and surrounding woods were covered in heavy blankets of snow. The grass and trees looked like they had been covered in thick layers of white cake frosting. At first, it was fun. They played board games, made popcorn, and drank hot coffee, but it felt very cozy. The trouble was the snow didn't stop. It kept falling, wet and heavy, and the temperature pumped so it too for cave for anyone to stay outside for long. Beneath the snow, the roads were a solid sh sheet of ice. As a result, they were trapped in the house, which was the last place Steve wanted to be, because they were there. They were always there, even though he only heard them at night, sometimes. Though he would never say it to Victoria, because she knew how delusional it sounded. It felt like they had made the snow happen because they put Steve there in the house. Right where they wanted him. The ringing was getting worse, too. The high-pitched sound was always in his head, day and night. Just like the house, he couldn't escape it. It was day five in the bazaar, and the snowfall was still heavy. Steve, Victoria, and the kids were sitting around the dinner table, eating macaroni and cheese and canned green beans Victoria had tried to jazz up in the salt butter and drill. I know this meal isn't up for my usual standards of cooking, Victoria said, but I'm having to dig through a pantry of food since we can't get out of the grocery store. I could eat mac and cheese every day, Abigail said. Of the two kids, she was the pick she wasn't the pickier eater. I'm sure you could, Victoria said. But I meant your papa would rather have a snake and some salad. Actually I'm kinda digging the mac and cheese, Steve said. It was a comfort food, and you certainly needed comfort, more than mere food could provide. Say, when was the last time you checked the weather? Not since this morning, Victoria said, unless you count looking out the window. Just what we needed, DJ said in his fake chimp voice. Had someone turned on the radio? More snow, the National Weather Service is calling for at least three more inches or more with a high of 15 degrees. It's going to be up in our eyeballs, people. This is DJ Dan, the music man, saying stay home and stay safe. Victoria got up and switched off the radio.